meeting will come to order. Uh, welcome everyone, glad to have you here uh, participating in our, our what could be a, will be a full evening, a number of uh, significant items that are on the agenda. Uh, we will open then with the uh, roll call. Mayor Wolkas. Here. Deputy Mayor Cohen. Here. Council Member Sorry. Emerson. Councilmember De La Isla. Here. Commissioner Bueller. Here. Commissioner Cook. Here. And Commissioner Archer. Here. And Mr. Cohen. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have some business that uh, I need to leave at seven, and I'd like to designate Councilwoman Hiller as my proxy after that. Okay, all right, thank you. That's taken care of. Um, the agenda item three, approval of the minutes. Uh, you received copies of the minutes. Uh, are there any, of, this is of the, the special meeting that was held March 29. Mm -hmm. Is there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Mr. Mayor? Yes. I would move for approval of the minutes as presented. It's been moved to approve the minutes. Second. Uh, second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the voting members, if you'd raise your right hand. We have six yes. Six having voted yes, the uh, minutes are approved as presented. Item four, presentations, the clerk would read. A is Go Topeka Annual Audit and First Quarter 2017 Report. Okay, the audit presentation. <clears throat> we have Morgan here that's from the previous years, we know. Yes, familiar. Uh, good evening, my name is Morgan Padgett with Mayor Hoffman McCann. What we have for you tonight is the final 2016 audit for Go Topeka. So I'm gonna walk you through just the highlights of that. If you have questions, we can talk about them. I'm not gonna walk through them um, every line or every footnote, but just wanna point out some of the key uh, points for you. The first thing that you have is a letter dated May 2nd addressed to the Board of Directors. This is a required communication that we issue in all audits. It's a report to the board, essentially how the audit went and what some of the key points are they should be aware of. So I just wanna point out just a handful of things in here. Uh, we'll look at some of these again in the footnotes and the financial statements, but again, just some things that we want you to keep in mind as we go through the financial statements. Under the first paragraph there, it says qualitative aspects of accounting practices. It does say that management's responsible for the selection and use of appropriate accounting policies. Those are all in note two that we'll look at here in a little bit. And what you should know is that there were no new accounting policies and no changes to those policies that were implemented during 2016. The next paragraph talks about estimates. There is one key estimate that we want you to be aware of, and that's how the value of pledged receivables is determined, and we'll look at that again in the footnotes. We know that that is an estimate based on management um, experience and past history with those pledges. Um, the rest of this goes on to talk about that we didn't have any difficulties during the audit, either with management or no disagreements about accounting or auditing matters, and that we're not aware of any consultations with other independent accountants. And that anything that we may talk about with staff or management during the course of the year is just part of our working relationship and not contingent on us being hired as the auditors. So a very clean, pretty standard language in this letter, things to keep in mind as we start to look at the actual financial statements themselves. All right, if we go to um, the next thing, pages one and two is our independent auditor's report. This is a clean, unmodified opinion, which means that the statements are materially correct, which is what we expect um, and like to see, so that's positive there. Starting on page three, the statement of financial position. This is essentially the balance sheet for Go Topeka. Some things to keep in mind as we look at these. These statements are on a full accrual basis. The ones that you see on a quarterly basis are on a modified cash basis. So there are some differences in how things are reported. And I'll kind of point out some of the big ones of that, the big differences, but just keep that in mind. And then this includes both public and private dollars as well. So it's all shown here together. 
So total assets at the end of 2016 is 20, just a little short of $27 million, majority of that being held in cash and investments, which are money markets and CDs. And then there are restricted funds for $2.3 million, and that's the escrow cap they have set up for Mars to draw on as they have as they um, collect on their incentives that they earned. And then $7.5 million in land held for economic development there. Uh, the third line down is pledges receivable for $613,000. That is the um, pledge campaign they did back in 2012 for private dollars. And so this is the last year. There are some amounts that are due in 2017 under those five-year pledges. So that is the amount of $613,000 that are due on those pledges in the, in the next year. Uh, and prior years, we've had a long-term piece of that. We don't have any of that because it is all expected to be collected in 2017. Looking at the liability section, total liabilities are $16.5 million, majority of that being held in that deferred grant revenue from JADO, that is 14.4, uh, that's the carryover that you have approved to be carried over and spent in future years of JADO funds. And then there's a liability of $1.4 million for improvement and training incentives. And those are ones that have been earned by Mars, but just haven't been collected yet by them out of the escrow account. Net assets of $10.4 million, which is the amount that your assets exceed your liabilities. And a um, majority of that is unrestricted. The board has set aside some $8.4 million for um, economic development. That's the land that's held, and also the amount, some of the amounts held in the Mars escrow account. And then the temporarily restricted is the pledges that are still outstanding as those have a time restriction on them. Okay, if we look at page four, this is where you're gonna see a lot of the differences between the modified cash and the accrual basis. So if we look at the total column for 2016, total support and revenues is $1.8 million. Um, to the JDO grant revenue of 1.6, under accrual method, we only record revenue as those funds are expended. So they didn't expend the entire five point, or the five line that was given to them during 2016. So the rest of that is in that deferred revenue amount on the balance sheet. So that is one big difference there. And then there also was 176,000 of private contributions and pledges with, out, um, collected during the year or received during the year. Uh, total expenses, a little over $3 million, 2.6 of that being for program, economic development, and the rest being for supporting expenses, and then gets us to a net loss on an accrual basis of $1.2 million, which essentially relates back to the private dollars that are being spent, that have been collected in a private period, um, and that have been expensed. That's what creates most of that loss. Okay. Page five is a statement of cash flows. This is gonna follow a little more like what you're used to seeing on the modified cash because this is how cash changes hands. So cash flow is some operating activities of $3.7 million. That first, very first line there of contributions, grants, and other support is 5.8. That's gonna be where you're gonna see the five million that was come in from their um, annual allocation. And then the rest of that's majority of the amount that they're collecting on the pledges in a year. So that's where that cash is coming in and you can see that. So 3.7 from operating activities, we then used 2.2 million for investing. Most of that is to uh, put some additional amounts into CDs and money markets during the year. So get you to a net increase in cash for the year of $1.4 million. All right, the footnotes start on page six. Note two I mentioned previously is the accounting policies. And again, there are no new ones and no changes that were put in place during 2016. So if we jump ahead to footnote number four, which is on page eight, um, this is gonna give you the in detail on the investments and show you that how they break down between the um, money market fund and then also the CDs. Hmm. And you can see the, the difference between 2016 and 2015. So they did put some additional amounts into those accounts and excess cash during the year. Uh, page nine, footnote number six, pledges receivable. I mentioned this before, but this just shows you again. 663,000 they expect to collect in 2017. They have a $50,000 allowance for possibly uncollectible amounts against that. Gets you to the $613,000 that was shown as that current asset on the previous page. Okay, but on number 11 on page 10, related party transactions. The first paragraph there talks about 2016, and in 2016 they implemented the shared services or purchase services agreement with the chamber, and under that, um, Go essentially purchases certain services from the chamber to include things like bookkeeping, accounting, auditing support, and support services for communications, marketing, and administrative functions, and it also includes a portion of the um, president's salary. And that, um, based on his estimate of 
what his time is spent on go Topeka activities. So for the 2016, that agreement was for $250,000 that go Topeka paid the chamber uh, for those services during the year. The last three paragraphs there talk about there are some small amounts owed between the chamber and the go Topeka at the end of the year just for either reimbursement of expenses or just um, involvement of go Topeka in of, of go Topeka employees in chamber activities. So they're outlined there as well. And the two paragraphs at the top of page 11 talk about grants that go Topeka made to um, entities related to the chamber foundation, specifically um, Seventh Home Innovations and Heartland Visioning. The JDO grant is explained in note 12. Um, again, the entire amount of the deferred revenue was approved for carryover. And of that amount, $908,000 was, was approved to be used on the minority and women-owned business program in future years. Number 13 just talks about concentrations. Of course, Gargo Topeka is heavily reliant on funding from JDO, and it does say that, that if there were any significant decreases in that, it would have an impact on the organization. They would have to curtail activities accordingly. And the last footnote I want to mention is number 15 on page 12 on incentives. The first paragraph there outlines certain incentive commitments that Go Topeka has entered into for $3.8 million. Those have not been earned yet by those, in, by those businesses, so they're not reported as a liability yet. Um, but if the business does what they have been asked to do or what they've agreed to do, they will be paid those amounts over those, over those time periods. Okay, and again, I want to just mention one other thing that we did not have a management letter again this year, so no internal control deficiencies to report, which is positive as well. So I'd entertain any questions that any of you had. Okay. Thank you for the complete, in-depth, concise <laughs> report. I uh, appreciate possible. it. No are problem. there are there questions, comments, any discussion on this? And I, again, this is not really our audit, it's of Go Topeka, but our um, contract with them, it is also presented to us as it is approved by the Go Topeka board uh, for our, and we do take action on it as we say, as it is an action item that we do report. Okay. We do have public comment. Mr. Yeah, I was going to have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. approve. And a second. Um, now we have public comment. Uh, Mr. Ledbetter. I'll wait my way. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a um, Commissioner um, Archer, Archer uh, moved and Councilwoman Elise a second on the uh, to approve the audit. Uh, no further discussion. All those in favor of approval, raise your right hand. We have seven yes. Seven having voted yes, the audit is approved. We go to uh, item agenda item uh, five. If the clerk would read. We have the first quarter 2017 um, report. That's, this is actually the second half of four, uh, going to the quarterly report, and Matt Varnick will lead off. Okay. Good evening, governing body. Um, I will just start by saying today's been a pretty good day in Topeka. Uh, Leadership Greater Topeka had its graduation uh, ceremony today, and I'd like to congratulate uh, Councilwoman De La Isla for uh, uh, being a leader Topeka style. <laughs> and uh, also Go Topeka had an annual meeting earlier uh, this evening and uh, we had a great crowd for that and we're able to talk about some of our accomplishments over the last uh, year. Um, 2017 has been a roller coaster of a year so far. I can't believe that we're only four months and about 10 days into it. Uh, first thing I want to do though is, is thank our, thank you, our elected leaders, uh, the ones that are in the room and the ones that are not in the room tonight, uh, for your efforts with St. Francis. Uh, on April 5th, we started hearing rumors, and a final announcement was just made last week uh, on May 4th. So, 29 fairly tumultuous days. Uh, I thank you all for your concern. Uh, I thank you for taking my calls. I thank you for your ideas. Uh, and I especially want to thank Commissioner Archer and Mayor Walgast for their attention and their hard work on this issue. Uh, they were in a lot of meetings that most people don't know they were in. And, uh, and, and they, they uh, came running every time we asked them to. And so I really appreciate uh, uh, the, team, uh, the team atmosphere that we had on this project and, and, and such a great outcome for us. Uh, I have been mentioning and continue to mention that, that I appreciate Stormont Vale and I want to publicly thank Stormont Vale 
uh, because in those first few days, when they, they were dark days, Stormont Vale stepped up and said, we are not gonna leave our community hanging. And, uh, and so I, I wanna thank Randy Peterson and the Stormont Vale Board for what they did, and they, they gave us assurance uh, in the first few days of that. So um, I don't wanna steal too much of Molly's thunder, but I, do, I am excited to hear her report. Uh, one of the things I think she's going to mention to you is that we're a finalist. Uh, we're in the final two communities on Project Spartan. We've talked to you a little bit about Project Spartan. Uh, we haven't told you much other than it's a biggie. And, and we're in the final of five communities on Project Ribeye, which is another biggie. So we still have our fingers crossed, and we're not just crossing our fingers. We're actually actually uh, working actively working these projects. A quick piece of good news, uh, as you may recall in March, it was announced that Alorica would be closing their doors at the end of May. Uh, in talks with Alorica executives this week, uh, they reported to me and to Barbara that over 200 of their employees have found jobs, uh, many and most making more money than they were making before. And they also feel very confident that the rest of the employees will find employment very quick. Uh, because of the efforts of Go Topeka, our workforce center, and partnering with 30 companies uh, who have come to hire uh, these folks. So this is really great news for us and a uh, little silver lining in, in a cloud. Um, so uh, now I really want to get out of your way and let the team uh, give you a brief first quarter report. Uh, if you've seen our new quarterly report, uh, I hope you uh, like the new format. We're very proud of it. Uh, but before I do, I want to brag on this team. Uh, you've heard me brag on them before, but the first four months of this year have not been business as usual. Uh, when you see our team, and that includes Go Topeka, Heartland Visioning, Forge, Chamber, 712 Innovations, uh, I encourage you to pat them on the back, uh, not just the ones that present tonight, but all of the staff, uh, and please thank them for their efforts because they are incredible. Uh, we showed a little video at our annual meeting and we want to show it to you too. Uh, so uh, we will cue that up, and uh, and then I, we will let the team uh, give you their brief reports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
It's a good video, and I think it hit right on exactly what we've been talking about, is we have momentum. And as we look over our first quarter report and talk about the activity we have, I think you guys will see that, and we're just going to keep that momentum going. So to give you an overview of kind of our whole project pipeline, to look at it holistically, we've got 31 active projects. You can see based on the pie chart up there that the majority of those, 20 of them, are in the manufacturing sector. Now, if we looked at these 31 projects and we said of those that we have the information for of what their employment count would be, if all of them come to fruition, which we know is probably not likely, but of that, that would equate to over 6,000 jobs. So you can see there's some big numbers here. And when we look at those 6,000 jobs, the average wage across those is over $43,000. So it's just a little bit higher than our county wage. So we do have a lot of activity going on. And that was kind of the holistic view. And if we break that down as we look at attraction projects versus business retention, of those 31, 10 of those projects are active business retention projects, so the companies that are in our community looking to expand. And those 10 projects equate to 873 jobs and then a capital investment of $193 million. So hopefully we can get some of those moving and land some of those this year and keep that momentum going. I also want to highlight a couple of things that I have heard when I've been out talking with our businesses and what are some of the themes that I've heard so far this year and I think um, there's really four things the first is that optimism so like the video said is you know there's really this vision and people are excited about Topeka and I'm hearing that with our businesses is it might not be this quarter or next quarter but they are looking to expand and when I say expand I mean that in a variety of ways it may be that they're adding people it may be that they're investing in capital investment or it may be that they're actually expanding their footprint or a mix of all of those. So when I talk about expansion, I kind of look at it from that perspective. The second thing that we continue to hear is, of course, workforce concerns. Where are they going to get these people, and will these people have the skills that they need? Um, quality of life can, continues to be a topic that's heard. There's concerns about are we, are we improving our quality of life, and how does that quality of life impact their ability to attract and retain good talent? And then the fourth thing that I've been hearing is um, there's some excitement about learning some of the projects. As a business owner, a lot of times you're so busy um, just doing your business that you may not know that there's opportunities for programs and, and different support that can help you. And so they get kind of excited to hear about, oh, a neighborhood revitalization program? I could be interested in that. Um, I also am hearing from our businesses that in terms of program, programs, they're looking for some innovation. Um, not just maybe the business that we've always kind of done, but looking at how can we help them with something a little bit different. Maybe they're trying to beautify their property. Maybe they're looking to go zero um, waste to landfill. And how can we assist with those? So I think they're going to push us to be a little more innovative as we move through the year. Now I will pass it over to Molly. Well, as Matt mentioned earlier, things have not um, slowed down on the business development front. Since January, we have hosted five site visits, and some of you and others in the room have gotten to meet um, one or two of those companies. And um, as Matt mentioned, we are one of two finalists for one of those projects and one of five for another. And so we're excited to hear um, coming decisions in the coming months. Um, I think that Project Ribeye is the one we've talked about most recently in, in this room, and um, that company is still going through due diligence and is moving a little slower than they anticipated, um, but that's the one that's looking at Central Crossing, and then Project Spartan is the one that we are one of two finalists for, and they are um, looking at almost all the remainder of the land at Consa Fire, so um, they would be Brett's neighbor over there um, at Mars. <laughs> Okay, and so of those, um, those are the three formal proposals that were submitted. We also had an advanced startup company that's still looking at us, um, and they're in a uh, hydroponic produce farm. And 12 consultant interactions, those are those face-to-face -face, um, conversations that, that I'm having with site consultants and companies that are looking to relocate or expand. So 12 in the first quarter, but um, just since quarter two has started, I've been on the road more and uh, about uh, two weeks ago met with 20 companies and site consultants in a 24-hour period and just kind of spent 25 to 30 minutes with each of them and uh, rotated around the room and talked about the assets that we have in Topeka and Shawnee County and how we could meet their needs for expansion and relocation projects. Okay, all right, thank you. You like our new way we're doing this? Yes. This is, <laughs> yes. 
Well, I just want to say that it is Small Business Week, and I want to um, say thank you to everyone that joined us on yesterday. We recognized four businesses and a first time an advocate of the year, so uh, we're really excited about it. If you have the opportunity, go out and shop small and think of small business. So we've been extremely busy this quarter. Uh, 22 incentives were issued, and uh, we had uh, 16 businesses that apply for those incentives. And a lot of people say the numbers don't work, but a lot of these businesses got more than one incentive. And so they have the opportunity to get four incentives, and they've taken full advantage of that. So just wanted to let you know that. We've uh, issued about 69, 70,000. We have a couple more out that are um, really outstanding that we're getting ready to issue now. They're not included in this number, but we're really excited about the impact that they're making. 52 full-time jobs and 26 part-time jobs were in impacted by the, um, the incentives that we issued. So we're really excited about that. Great opportunity here, that incentive program. Um, our financial tools that we're using now are, is our loan fund, and we've issued a loan and first time a line of credit. The loan was 400 and, four, I'm sorry, 40,000. The line of credit was 50,000. And so this is our first time issuing a line of credit. It hasn't been used, but we think that this is a new frontier for us as well, because a lot of times individuals don't need that full amount. They just need to have it there in case of emergency. And so we've done that through the loan fund. The Mid-America Angels, you've heard us talk a little bit about, uh, they are steadily growing. So when we created this slide, they were at 24, 23 angels as of yesterday, or we're at 24 angels. And so those individuals are going to help us grow our small business community by investing in those businesses. Really excited. Businesses have pitched to, three businesses have pitched to the angel investors, and they're looking for approximately $4 million between the three of them. Um, some are already full funded, and uh, the others are still, we're still putting together that package, so we're excited about that. And then finally, we have had um, a new venture graduate program. Uh, we had 13 individuals participate in that program, and out of the 13 that participated, we had three businesses that have already started, and they are taking advantage of the incentives as well. Um, this picture that you're looking at is a um, picture of our women's forum. We did have a women's forum this fall. I'm, I'm sorry, this spring. I am rushing time. I am sorry. Uh, this spring, and that women's forum was really jam-packed. We had 250 women in there, and we talked a lot about leadership. So thank you, um, uh, Councilwoman. We appreciate it. Yeah, Councilwoman Daly. Yes. <laughs> Who else was in that room? Okay. So we've had a really, really um, hyper fast uh, first quarter, and we look forward to doing the same in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm here back to give you some updates on 712 Innovations and what we have happening. We still average about 125 members per month, and as you'll remember, it's a month-by-month -month membership that we do have um, there at 712. We um, continue to have investors as well as Washburn students from the business school, and we've added the art department um, to that now, so we have art students as well who are joining us, and our um, small businesses, including architects and geologists and um, uh, actually IT, there's someone who's looking into providing some free uh, Wi-Fi, perhaps. Um, and then we're home to 30 businesses, two of which um, were nominated for the Small Business Awards yesterday, and so we have a very successful, exciting group. Um, and we are the proud hosts of One Million Cups Topeka, mm -hmm. and they're the first Wednesday of every month from 9 a.m. to 10 o'clock. And there, two entrepreneurs can talk about their new companies and get support from their colleagues as well as um, the community. And we've had 15 presenters um, present about their new businesses in that open to the public um, opportunity. And we hope that you would join us some Wednesday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening. 
just to touch on a few, it looks like a lot, there's a lot in workforce and education going on, but first of all, to touch on our continuation. We talked about with employers, they're requesting through the business retention and expansion program, the different needs that they have, and you heard that they have those needs for a talented workforce, so we're focusing initiatives on the future talent pipeline so that we can build the seven foundational work ethic behaviors in our, in our future pipeline. We've offered train the trainer sessions for the educators at the school districts to be able to implement and weave that curriculum into their programming for their students through career technical education. We've also provided, um, hosted a legislative luncheon for the superintendents within the county and the local legislators so that they could discuss economic, or pardon me, education issues within the legislative session. And um, then we move on, we, we have, you saw the JDO scholarships that we've done over the course of, in the in the video since 2014, you know, 264 scholarships and over $141,000. We've touched over 153 students' lives. But just in this quarter, we at Washburn Tech issued 43 scholarships for the spring 2017 semester, and that totaled over $27,000. Again, impacting more students just this current academic year. And with the Work Ready community, I would mentioned it previously to you, the ACT Work Ready community, we're really focusing right now on the local team that we've developed and developing that framework for a Work Ready community, whether it's it's through ACT's programming or whether it's through developing the framework that we have locally and what's, what works best for the community, the city, the county. So we have that going on. And then top city interns. Um, I think if you hadn't had an opportunity to see that press conference, that was great, very exciting. Another wonderful partnership that we have um, through Ford, Washburn University, the community with employers. We have over eight employers participating right now and 90 five interns currently signed up for that intern program and that included, and I know it's close to Councilwoman <laughs> Tela Isla's heart, but included, we had a very successful CEO roundup in March. We had both CEO panelists as well as young professional panelists talking about what diversity and inclusion means within their workplace and really the, the effort and the intent of included is to serve as a platform for our organizations to develop their DNI strategy, provide resources and materials to support those initiatives in addition to offering regular meetings so they can have a discussion about the challenges and the solutions that an, an organization may see. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our report. <laughs> well, I, I think I speak, we certainly appreciate this presentation and the manner in which you're doing it and concise, together, short, and uh, but all the information there that, that certainly we, we want, we, we need to hear. Uh, go to item B of uh, item, agenda item four. The city and county project priority lists and project status updates. Okay, in this, in the recent interlocal that was approved last year, we included uh, a segment, a statement in there that at the May uh, quarterly JADO meeting, we would have an update on the the other side of the um, half cent sales tax. It doesn't do, isn't specifically for the economic development part that goes to go to PICA, but it's the other, the infrastructure side. Uh, so the committee has put together the report that you received the packet and uh, Jason Peake is here from the Public Works uh, Director of the City to give a brief overview. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we submitted a report, a uh, summary of kind of current activities with the uh, countywide uh, project. Um, out of the uh, current countywide, we have uh, three projects to report on. Uh, the Kansas Expo Center renovation project for Shawnee County. Uh, they've entered into a contract with HTK Architects. Uh, related to the planned renovations uh, and moving forward uh, with that project. On the city side, we have uh, two projects to report on. Uh, the trackway improvement project for Southwest 6th Avenue between Gage and Fairlawn. Uh, we've currently started utility relocation process, uh, the process and uh, construction bids are on the street for that project. Um, 
or will be on the str uh, street for that project uh, looking for a June award in construction starting in July uh, for the first phase of that project. And then this week we've uh, forwarded a, a contract award for the Topeka Zoo Master Plan, uh, the Camp Calabunga expansion uh, through our uh, administrative approval process for the contract bid award uh, for Camp Calabunga. And then the uh, last part of the report uh, that we provided to you was on the previous countywide sales tax. We have the Southwest 21st uh, Eurish to Indian Hills project. That project is scheduled for final completion for May 15th, and that will conclude all the projects from that first phase of the countywide sales tax. And with that, I would stand for any questions that you may have. And I think, again, <clears throat> as I recall, uh, this body does not oversee these projects. The county and the city each is responsible for their own projects. And I think we put this in here so that the, this, we would report to each other what's happening. Right. And that's really, that's really the purpose of it, rather than we're not here to discuss how they're doing or we're doing on projects, but just to, to inform one another of what's going on. But certainly, if there are questions on any of the projects. Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that include that is all of agenda item four. And we'll go to agenda item five. Five is the 2016 JETO audit report and JETO finance committee first quarter cash statement. All right. And making that report is the uh, director of finance for the city, uh, Nikki Lee. Good evening. The Go Topeka audit report was a very good precursor to this, just to remind you of the accrual basis versus the cash basis. Um, for those of you that follow that and try to tie back this report versus the year-end 2016 report, so a good reminder that those balances won't tie up exactly because of the change in the, the difference in the way that we account for that. Um, as far as the JADO audit go goes, it's a, an annual audit and a pretty simple audit. You all have received the hard copy it's also posted online. It's a few pages, and that's simply because as an organization, um, JADO is a pass-through for the most part onto projects within the city and the county organization. Um, so again, a pretty simple statement with a lot, of, not a lot of um, kind of activity in that fund. Um, so I would really just stand for questions that you may have about it. Are there any questions on the Go Topeka, or rather the JADO audit? Seeing none, your pleasure. Move to approve. It's yes, uh, Kishner Archer moved to approve. Councilman Elise Le seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. The voting members. We have seven yes. Seven having voted yes, the audit is approved. And then you, your second phase sure. is. Uh, so moving report. on to the cash statement through March 31st. Um, one reminder on this is that the cash statement currently includes not only the balance of the phase one of the tax that ended through 2016, but also the beginning of the year acti activity through um, 2017. So once we are through with the, all of the 2016 projects and those funds are sent out to the respective um, city and county, then in the future this will be just the portion of the tax of this point moving forward. And for the most part, um, we'll receive funds, pay out the go to peak portion, and then split it out to the city and the county per the, um, the formula that's been established. So it'll be a little bit simpler moving forward, and for the most part, depending on the timing, um, we'll really uh, not carry as much of a balance as it has right now. Any questions on the quarterly report? <coughs> Seeing none, thank, thank you very you. much completes agenda item five, ready for agenda item six. Is there approval of contract between Go Topeka and Mars Chocolate North America? Okay, that's Jackie. Actually, right. now we get into more interesting parts of the agenda. Yes. We took care of all that other stuff. <laughs> now let's get down to the real stuff. And this is the, the fun part of the agenda. So tonight we have the contract between Go Topeka and Mars, and this is for a project that we did the funding approval for on March 29th that was referred to as Project Fairway. Just to refresh everyone's memory, Mars is looking at doing a $55 million capital investment in their facility. The majority of that $50 million will be in equipment, and what they're going to do with that equipment is they are not only making, going to make right Twix at our plant, but our plant is so sweet, they're going to make left Twix as well. <laughs> so we got both of them. And everyone should have, um, well, they might just have wrappers now. These were on your, on your space. So I'm <laughs> in the back, too. 
so let's all celebrate that this is a big deal. Um, so just a, a little reminder, this is going to be a, an addendum to the original contract. The original contract was approved in 2011. There was a first addendum that was done in 2015 that was to add the Carmel line, and now this will be in a second addendum. And really the reason for the addendums versus a new contract is because we're just looking at capital investment. Um, there is gonna be 60 jobs with this, but that will go towards that original contract of the 425, and, and they're pretty close to that number right now. Um, just a reminder, the incentives for this, we're looking at just under 125,000. It would be a max of $124,715 in incentives. And this is, again, specifically for that $55 million in capital investments, and it would be performance-based. So what I'm looking for tonight is a motion to approve the second addendum to the Go to Pika Mars incentive agreement. We also have Brett Spangler, who is the plant manager, is here to answer any questions, and I'd also be happy to answer any questions. Why don't you um, invite you to the podium to um, have that opportunity to make some comments, and I'll <laughs> answer any questions. <laughs> no, I think uh, we talked earlier, so I just I can't thank this group enough, as well as Go Topeka, the state of Kansas, city of Topeka in general, just the support we've received over the years, right? So I think. We're approaching, well, we're actually just over about a half a billion dollars since we arrived in Topeka. And as uh, Jackie mentioned, we're pushing out 425 associates once this Twix project is uh, is in full play. So I can't thank you enough for this kind of support. It does really instill confidence in the fact that we're in for a mutual relationship. We're building a business for the long term, right? So I think the, the second thing I would say, though, and uh, Barbara mentioned it earlier, is just the focus that all the people in this room, as well as the Workforce Development Group, go Topeka, Barbara specifically, the focus on workforce development is critical. And I tell you, we've got very strong partnerships. So we really appreciate that. We just did our last hiring event. Uh, believe it or not, we've actually got all the Twix people identified at this point. So in <laughs> one day's time, we actually identified that number of people. So uh, the workforce group is actually growing. So we're happy to see that. And it, uh, I have to make admit, make me a little faint to see some of the numbers they were sharing a little bit earlier. But uh, I'm sure we're going to continue to build that workforce group that we need. So. Really appreciate thank the you. Support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions, uh, Councilman? Yes. Could you would make a motion. All right. Um, and so, Councilman Isla is moving to approve the. I think we said the second, uh, which is an amendment to the original incentive agreement. Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'll second, but I do have a question for Mr. Spangler. Okay. Very good. Thank you. We're well, ready for questions and discussion. Mr. Spangler, you know, the capital investment, the economics impact, the workforce development, you know, we talk about Mars coming into our community. What are some of the ways that Mars is giving back and really working within the community to make not just the uh, workforce development, but the social um, contribution to their community. Yeah, I think there's, there's a number of ways, and we, we were uh, talking earlier today just on the number of relationships we've built between harvesters, uh, the Habitat for Humanity, all those different types of activities. And I think there's one probably not well-known uh, thing that we do within Mars is every associate gets at least eight hours of community service that's paid. So we want to make sure that we're encouraging people to get out in the community, build the relationships, and really drive the things we want to do. We want to continue to invest as far as in the downtown. Of course, the first annual Chocolate Festival will become the second <laughs> annual Chocolate <laughs> Festival this year. So we want to continue to build those relationships. And I can tell you just the, the pride that we have in the community, the, the associate base there. Um, one thing I did forget to mention that uh, with the Carmel Line, uh, there's an extreme amount of pride. I mean, I think I've heard enough stories now about the fact we're running out on shelves already, but we're making as fast as we can. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've got a couple of billboards that are going up. So one will be on Wanamaker, the other will be on Topeka Boulevard. That's actually calling out the fact that Carmel was made right here in Topeka, Kansas. It's the only place globally that makes Carmel. We want to continue to make sure people understand the pride we have in the Topeka community. Nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I, I think good. that's good. important that we talk not just about the contribution, but also those other contributions to the community. Yeah, Thank you. Out, yeah, we're partners in the community. Any other questions, items for discussion? Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we do have one uh, person signed to speak. That is Joe Ledbetter. I just want to sound record. I definitely am for this. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and second before us to approve this to the amended contract. All those in favor, raise your right hand. How about your right twix? Right. <laughs> 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 right. All right. We have seven. 
quick. Seven having voted yes, the contract is approved. Well, that was sweet. Yes. Uh, all right. Going on. Uh, agenda item seven. Seven is approval of funding for Morris Project. All right, Molly. Okay, so you have a memo in your packet that goes into a little more detail about this project, but there's a company um, that is in a nearby community, um, in actually in rural Jefferson County, that uh, contacted me and is interested in moving to Topeka. They currently have 55 employees and are looking to add 45 more. So um, that's the reason why you see the number of 45 jobs there, because um, in all likelihood, those 55 that exist are probably already in our community. So we're looking at incentivizing the 45 new jobs and the two million in capital investment for the building that they are going to acquire in Topeka. The average rate, wage is pretty good, um, just under $50,000 a year. And this company is a company that has uh, strong relationships with some of our other major employers in the community, so it will be a benefit to both parties to have them closer and um, at uh, an easier access point for them. So the economic impact is 4.5 million for one time and then 33.4 million economic impact recurring. So um, this, this company plans to add those 45 jobs over a period of five years and they are a growing company so I wouldn't be surprised if we don't come back and, and have an amendment to their contract sometime in the future. So what we're asking for tonight is um, a maximum of $229,000 in incentives for those 45 new jobs and two million in capital investment. So I would stand for any questions. Are there questions? What is the time frame if this, if it, everything goes along as sure. we would hope it does? So they are doing due diligence on the building right now and going through um, environmental and all uh, and all the background and, and making sure that the building is sound and and everything like that, um, which is why we still have them as a, a Project Morris instead of the company name, just because um, we want to be sensitive to that building acquisition. I would assume uh, they haven't given me a, a hard and fast deadline or of when they plan to make their their purchase of the building but you know they're in in the in the trenches right now going through that due diligence so probably in the coming weeks um, we'll be able to announce and then we'll probably have to have a special meeting to come back and present the contract to you all for approval. okay thank you Mr. Questions. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. the contract is performance based but what's the timeline for the performance to be awarded is it a one-year performance is it two years what's our term that we're, con we're negotiating for? The contract hasn't been drafted yet, but um, the terms that we've talked about would be that they would create these 45 jobs within five years, and they would be paid out annually per job based on however many, so if they hire the 20 new in one year, they would get paid a portion, a fifth of their of their incentive each year going forward to make sure that they, they still retain those. And those are just for job-based incentives. Just for the just it's for not the a jobs. capital. It's not a capital investment. They are receiving a small mm -hmm. capital investment, um, but that's part of that 229. So um, it's four thousand dollars for their capital investment. And is the there a time frame we're talking about? Is it a five year for that capital investment or immediate capital investment? Once they prove that they have invested that amount, then they would be awarded their okay. incentive. Okay. Good. Other questions. Right, um, and your pleasure. Councilman DeLisla. He moves to, um, are you approving the incentive? Yeah, a motion to, to approve, approve the funding incentive package of $229,000. Okay, that's what you have moved, and Councilman Emerson seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. We have seven yes. Seven having voted yes, the motion is approved. The incentive package is approved. We go to item eight. It is um, action item against uh, East Topeka Learning Center. Okay, and and you will notice on there on your agenda, um, board members, there's, there's really three parts to this. Only the second one is an action item, and we had people sign up to speak on this, so we'll have the, those will speak on that item. But if they want to speak on any of the three, would be fine because we didn't state that. Uh, what they would be working on. So the first item is on the um, new market tax credits, mm -hmm. Barbara. 
Thank you. And I just wanted to introduce, I, I lined up um, several to speak with you this evening on these three different items. First, I have Jeff White with Columbia Capital. He'll explain a little bit more in detail the new market tax credits, be able to answer any questions that you might have. And then both Dean Farrell and Corey Dean, who were part of the members on the selection committee for the design um, selection, will present that. That That is a recommendation. I will present the, the third item related to an update on the Jado Washburn agreement, and we'll actually request the the action on B after C, if that's all right. So you can still do discussion at the end if that's if that works better for you. Jeff. Okay. If I got that. Yes. Mr. Hello. Chairman, members of the board, good to see you, see you this evening. So Barbara indicated that you didn't really want to spend a half hour talking about new market tax credits tonight, which disappoints me to, to no end. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through uh, just a fraction of the slides you have in your packet. I'm happy to try and answer any questions you, you have along the way. So the presentation is going to give you a kind of a big picture. What's this program about? Where does it work in Topeka? How does it work in Topeka? And then we'll talk about how it might work for this specific project. So the new markets tax credits may have been the, the uh, last effort at congressional bipartisanship uh, back around 2000 when the, when the law was enacted and uh, really came about with the first projects in about 2002 or 2003. So it's been around for a while. The statute uh, created the program to incentivize private investment in what the statute calls low-income communities. Those communities are determined primarily geographically, census tract by census tract, and really looking at areas that have high unemployment, um, uh, high poverty rates, and, uh, and low family incomes. So the way the program works is for qualified projects and investments made in a low-income community, and the investor in that project receives a federal income tax credit. Federal income tax credit is equal to 39% of the investment that's made in those communities, and it's paid out over seven years. Works like a phone number. It's 555-6666, so 5%, 5%, so on. Uh, because of the way the program works and because the, that tax credit equity is more valuable today than it is paid out in chunks over seven years, typically what happens is that tax credit equity comes in all at one time at the beginning of the project on a discounted basis, and then that equity is available as part of the capital stack to, to complete your construction project. There are a very broad range of permitted uses. Um, I'm actually going to talk about it backwards. The ones that are not permitted are those that are considered to be sin businesses. So as long as we're not talking about package retail liquor, suntan parlors, gambling, horse racing tracks, golf courses, and there may be one or two others, we're fine. Almost everything else qualifies. And the program has been used nationally for a very wide range uh, of, of projects, both uh, for nonprofits, community facilities, grocery stores and food deserts, job creation, assistance to manufacturing companies, uh, a wide variety of, of different types of uh, uh, programs here. So uh, just to give you a sense of how this works in Topeka, um, again, I mentioned that the program is really geographic. Uh, this slide cut off my, uh, um, my legend, so let me give you the legend real quick about what the colors are. So the program talks about eligible census tracts. Those are the ones that are in orange and in blue. The census tracts in green, which is primarily southwest, and the areas northwest and north of the city are not qualified, meaning that they don't meet the statutory criteria. Although theoretically anything in the orange and the blue qualifies for new markets, the way the program has evolved, really only projects in the blue areas, which are considered to have high distress, uh, receive funding. And so you can see our dot right there in the middle where uh, the site for East Topeka Learning Center uh, would fit nicely within that, um, in that, in that blue area. So the parties that are involved, and this is a little preface to the next slide where I kind of cut to the chase on the money. You have an investor. These are the folks, typically commercial banks, that are interested in making an investment in, in uh, a low-income community and getting that tax credit benefit in exchange. For any of you who are familiar with low-income housing tax credits, the investor in those projects actually has project risk. In new markets tax credits, the only return the investor is looking for is um, by buying those credits at a discount, typically 85 cents on the dollar today, and then receiving those credits at face value over the seven-year life of the project. 
Uh, the sponsor uh, in this case would be you folks, the folks who are interested in having a, a project come about. The way the, the program works is Congress allocates a certain amount of project authority annually as part of the budget. And in fact, uh, last year they decided to extend the program for five years, which is pretty nice. We have some certainty. So uh, in most years, there's three and a half billion dollars of project allocation available nationwide. That three and a half billion dollars is then um, uh, distributed among um, intermediaries called community development entities or CDEs. CDEs go through a competitive process managed by the Treasury Department in order to apply for and receive allocation. Typical allocations range from anywhere between five million dollars to 70 or 80 million dollars uh, and Treasury typically funds 70 to 90 different CDEs each year. So those CDEs each have um, a geographic coverage and they have a mission and that mission can range from a social mission to a profit-based one and the geography can range from an individual community all the way to nationwide. So to give you an example, there are two very successful CDEs in Kansas City, Missouri. One was actually created by the city of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and it has a, a social mission, which is to spur economic development in distressed parts of Kansas City, Missouri. They can only do projects within the corporate boundaries of, of KCMO. There's another CDE in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, that has a nationwide presence, but they only do projects in what they consider to be Indian country, so na reservations, native lands, those kinds of things. So they work all over the country, but only on very specific projects. And that just kind of gives you a sense of the CDs that are out there. We then have something called the Qualic B, um, which I will just shorten to talk about the borrower. This is the entity at the bottom that's getting the benefit of the new market's tax credits. In our case here for East Topeka Learning Center, we would be creating a new entity to be, to be the quality uh, over, the, over the life of the, uh, of the financing. And then the last uh, big player is a leverage lender. And the purpose of the leverage lender is to actually boost the tax credit basis so that you get more tax credits. And in that case, that's going to be um, the, uh, you or Go Topeka, we'll figure that out, will be the leverage lender. Uh, with the sales tax dollars that, that you've collected for this particular project. So what does the money look like? It looks like this. So uh, building quickly on your expansive knowledge of new markets that, that you ha have just uh, <laughs> earned, what happens is at closing we have an investor that brings uh, $2.15 million in net new market tax credit equity. We have the leverage lender, you, bringing $4.5 million in sales tax monies. Those flow into an investment fund. The investment fund is created specifically for the purpose of this project. That investment fund uh, makes a, an equity investment in a community development entity, which then makes two loans, typically, uh, to the borrower at the bottom. The A loan, you'll notice, corresponds nicely with the amount of the leverage loan that came in at the top. The B loan actually corresponds, if you do a little bit of math, to the amount of new markets equity that came in, less some fees that got scraped off as we went along. The magic to this program is that at the end of the seven year compliance period, the B loan is, and the lawyers hate it when I use the word, forgiven. The B loan goes away. Uh, in this case, the A loan also goes away. You're gonna be lending money to your own affiliate, and at the end of the seven years, you have a very nice conversation where you say, hey, self, would you like this building? Yes, I would. Let's tear up that note. And you end up with a facility that was partially financed with other people's money, which is really the, the intent of the program at the end of the day. So cutting to next steps, and then I'm happy to tr try and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we find ourselves in actually a great spot. The, um, the application round for the 2017 allocation just came out last week. Uh, those applications are due to Treasury roughly at the end of June. Uh, and those awards will be made later this year. We also have the largest allocation um, that's been made in the history of the New Markets Program. Uh, Treasury, because Congress didn't get around to doing things quickly enough, ended up merging the 2015 and 2016 rounds last year, so there's $7 billion of allocation on the street today, another $3.5 billion coming this winter. Um, so we're in a good spot with this project. 
The other reason we're in a good spot with this project is that Treasury considers Kansas to be an underserved state. So over the life of the New Markets Program, what they've found by whatever math they use is that Kansas has not gotten its fair share of projects. They provide an incentive for CDEs uh, to, to serve underserved states. And so there may be money out there looking for projects in underserved states, and this, this may fit perfectly. The other reason I think the market's really gonna like this project, besides the fact that Kansas is an underserved state, is most CDEs are looking for projects that produce a lot of community benefit. And you can measure that in a variety of ways, but certainly the kinds of things that the Learning Center plans to do, I think is really gonna speak to, uh, to CDEs looking to make a splash. And uh, just like every other organization in the world, if you're grant funded, this really isn't grant funded, uh, you want to do a good job spending your grant money this year so that when you apply for the grant next year, uh, your funding agency will say, hey, they did a super job, look at this project they funded. So those CDEs are really looking for projects that have a high degree of community impact. So I, don't, I, I didn't keep track of when I started. That may be the shortest New Markets presentation I've ever given, but uh, Mr. Very Chairman, good, I'd be you. happy to try and answer yeah. any questions. Questions, discussion? Go ahead, yes, Mr. Mayor. It is a competitive process that we go through. Well, the, the, this, it, it is. So the, the challenge is for us is we decide to proceed with this. Right. We have to find a CDE that both likes the project and has allocation to give to us. Once we find that, um, we will be in very good good shape to, to go ahead and actually close on the new markets financing. That's the challenging part, is finding the CDE that both wants to do this project and happens to have the allocation available to us. The timing is great because there, there is money kicking around from previous rounds. Hard to find, but it's kicking around. But we're also in a spot where we can get into somebody's application for 2017 money and kind of assure ourselves of a spot if that CDE happens to get funded in the next round. But we won't know until the end of the year from... Yeah, I think if we were to get going, um, we would know fairly quickly if we were going to see any money, okay. any allocation shake okay. out from rounds that have already been done. But otherwise, yes, we're waiting to the end of the okay. year. Okay. Right, well, I guess my point is that I, I think we need to know, in, in case we don't get uh, the, the credits, you know, what's plan B? Where, where do we go from there? I know when we were, we were looking at financing the Willard Bridge, we put in for a Tiger grant, and I thought it was well documented. We we spent quite a bit of money on consultant, and they just said no. Right. Uh, and that, so I'm I'm just concerned that we uh, we're too confident that something's going to get approved, and we don't have a plan B to address the issue in case it's not. You definitely need a plan B. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Oh, along that line, uh, since we're planning, if we put in for the. Um, application not knowing till November is it prudent for us to continue with the selection of the architects selection with the renovations can we continue the project moving forward or do we put the project on hold until we know whether or not we would have that funding how is it viewed by the uh, the, the investor so the dumbest thing about this program in my mind is that there's required to be a need for outside funding to complete the capital stack, but no one will close on these financings until the deal is completely baked, totally designed, guaranteed maximum price contract in place, you know, all the site controls in place. So to directly answer your question, absolutely positively keep the project moving forward, because if we are lucky enough to find some allocation, um, as soon as we do, the folks involved are going to want us to move as expeditiously as possible to, to get the transaction closed. So absolutely keep it moving. Yeah. What is an approximate amount that you think with with our with this particular project that would be in the ballpark? What yeah, we might so, so we're looking for, to, to make the math work, roughly a, a $6.7 million allocation of new markets tax credits. Um, it is rare in my experience to see a CDE, a single CDE do more than 10 or $12 million. Uh, and, and you may have heard horror stories about this project and some of them, or, or this program, some of them are, are probably true. Projects under four or $5 million are tough to do because the, the fixed transaction costs really eat up a lot of the economic benefit. I actually think this project is in a sweet spot. Um, the allocation is large enough that the economics make sense. 
um, and it's of a, a unique enough size that there may be a CDE out there that that you know has a sliver of allocation left that this would okay. be perfect for. Very good. Other other questions, Councilman Emerson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jeff, uh, I'm sure you've ran the numbers on this as far as. Um, can you tell me what it nets out? I mean, what, what it would cost us, what we'd have to spend, and I guess what the net benefit would be if we get allocated exactly what we're asking yep. for? So uh, if you look at the slide here, basically what we're saying is if you contribute $4.5 million in the form of a leverage loan to the project, um, by quick math, I'm showing you to have enough to construct the project as, um, as currently proposed in terms of scope and size and have sufficient funds to make that operating subsidy for the first couple years. So this basically gets you to full project funding for a four and a half million dollar investment. Okay, thank you. And if we apply for this, do we have sunk cost just in the application process? And even if we're not we've approved? We've proposed a contingent fee to help you get there based upon closing. So the only sunk cost if we're unsuccessful is mine. That's great. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Com Commissioner Cook. And I think you answered the question I had, but I just want to make sure. Um, the risk in applying for a new market tax credit, what's the risk to uh, Jado or to go to PICA in doing this application? So there's zero risk in, in going through the process to find out whether we can find allocation to put a financing together. In the financing, there are theoretical risks um, involved in the actual financing itself, and the biggest one comes in the form of a sponsor guarantee uh, of a tax credit recapture. So keep in mind that um, over the seven-year compliance period, if there's an event of non-compliance, that uh, the federal government can come in and say, hey, you're non-compliant, and can actually require repayment of the gross amount of the tax credits that were earned by the project going all the way back to day one. Wow. That risk is, it sounds worse than it is because the in a real estate project like this one, really the only way to mess it up, there's two ways. One is to pick up the project and move it to a non-qualified census tract. It sounds silly, but if you're financing delivery vehicles, it's a bigger problem than it is for a, for a building. So that, that one's really off the table. And then the other one you have complete control over, which is using the facility for a qualified use or to put it backwards, not using the facility for one of those sin businesses I talked about. With, with those two things and routine kind of compliance and reporting things that either of your staffs uh, are, are completely used to with the grants that you currently manage both at Shawnee County and at the city of Topeka, um, I, you know, I would fully expect that, that you know, you would have no compliance issues and the risk of that occurring would be very small. Mr. Mayor, okay. so it, hypothetically, and again, I put this as a hypothetical, if we get five years into the program and for whatever reason, um, Washburn University sees that it's not economically feasible to continue with the Washburn Tech East um, facility and we stop, and it's no longer being used for an educational purpose, it's sitting vacant, would that be a non-compliance? It would not. It would not. The program has contemplated that, that if you're financing businesses, in many cases these, this program does finance private businesses, and those businesses need financial assistance by definition, uh, and, and they can't get that financial assistance through the regular capital markets. By definition, they're riskier than they would be otherwise. And so the program contemplates that some businesses may not last the full seven years. So an empty building is not an event of noncompliance. It only turns into an event of noncompliance if you then put a non-qualified use in that, in that facility. If we turn it into a wholesale alcohol distribution. Right. Wholesale is fine. <laughs> wholesale is fine. I, I, worked, I, I, worked, I worked on a new market deal in Texas moving a beer distributor's main distribution warehouse from, from a city that was flooded in Hurricane Ike to a city that wasn't. So wholesale, it's retail package liquor that's the problem. <laughs> okay. Let's close the, what, a couple more questions and then we're going to move on. Thank you, Your Honor. I have two questions. 
Uh, how is golfing a sin business? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Oh, dear. You'll have to ask your congressman about that. My second question is, does accepting these credits put some sort of restrictions on the project, similar to if you accept historic tax credits, they limit what you can do? Does accepting this limit the type of contractors we're allowed to hire? I'm looking for would it actually raise the cost because we would have to jump through additional hoops with, with vendors and contractors to execute the project? There, there's no kind of historic tax credit hangover, as you mentioned, no restrictions on what contractors you use. Um, there are ongoing costs paid to this intermediary, the CDE. Uh, and they're either escrowed at the beginning or they're paid over time, and, and I've got that. You'll see that noted in the in the slide that you that that's still up at the moment. So, um, other than the uh, other than the kind of routine reporting things that some organizations aren't used to, you guys are, but some organizations aren't used to. They find that to be the most noisome part of the of the process. So it's pretty low impact once the financing gets closed. Thank okay, you. let's go on to thank you, thank you. and you'll thank stay here in sure. case we have other questions coming up. We go to phase two on the uh, architect and the, the building. Just advance through with this. We'll get you back up to where you ah. Yeah, go, go one more. Ooh. There you go. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, Dean, Dean Farrell here. This is Corey Dean. We were tasked with the, uh, 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 the duty of trying to make a recommendation to you folks on the design teams. Our committee, in addition to Corey and myself, consisted of uh, Clark Coco, Clayton Tatro, both of Warsburg Tech, and also Rich Connell, uh, Director of Facilities at Warsburg. Uh, we advertised a uh, request for qualifications, and we received six responses from uh, six very qualified firms. Uh, uh, those were all written presentations. Uh, we sat down, reviewed the written presentations, and shortlisted it to three, whereby we allowed them to give us oral presentations and interviews. From that. From that point, we selected who we considered was the best, and I will tell you it was tough because they were all very qualified. Uh, our recommendation is to uh, have you award a contract to HTK, the local uh, design firm, and uh, I believe uh, most of their consultants will be local as well. Good, great, okay, thank you. Do you wish to, um, Mr. Dean, you want to add? I'm just eye candy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we're, we're the Dean and Dean boys. Dean, <laughs> Dean and Dean, okay. Are there, are there uh, board members, are there any questions, <laughs> items? Okay, we will then go to phase three and come back and have a motion on this. Item three is in the agreement. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to talk with you. I assured you in March that I would have an update for you on the Jado Washburn Agreement, and I do. I first want to share with you what was built into this two-part agreement. It's a joint education agreement, which houses both a lease component that currently has a 10-year term beginning July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2028. There is a base rent of $1 a year, and it does indicate that Washburn Tech will be responsible for all operational expenses, utilities, insurance, security, and maintenance. Those are fairly standard in that lease agreement. The second component of that agreement is the educational services component, and which we've talked about, you've heard in the past, will provide high-wage, high-demand programs, the adult education services, including the GED testing site, as well as academic and career advising, financial literacy, information literacy, and technology. You've seen all of those things before in the executive summary that was, has been provided in the past, but wanted to give that update again. And then if you look at your packet in item eight, I have I've provided a project update, so it included information related 
related to the lease and educational services agreement as well as the request for qualifications for design that Dean Squared just reported on as well as the program subsidy, subsidy the new markets tax credits. But my update specifically is related to that agreement and at the time of the packet when we sent this out, it was currently under review by Washburn University. We did receive a red line copy back from Washburn University at the end of last week. Both Jado Council as well as Go Topeka's Council reviewed that and met this afternoon to go through all of those and collaborate in terms of a response to Washburn. Um, there were changes that were accepted. There are changes that they'd like to discuss further. And so the next course of action is to bring both council from Jado as well as Go Topeka and Washburn University together. The intent is to get that on the agenda for next week so that they can discuss those and move those forward and hopefully then um, call a meeting as soon as we're able to get all of those agreements and those, those red lines gone, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, the other thing that we did have last week, our uh, GO board Chair Wendy Wells requested a work group to meet. We met yes last Monday, um, pulled together several members of the community, and uh, were able to talk with Washburn as well related to items needed in terms of support of everything. We did receive a pro forma from, from Washburn yesterday, and I shared that with that work group. That gives us an idea. Granted, uh, pro formas are uh, you know, a forecasted estimate for operations of the Learning Center, and so it may of course update and adapt throughout the life of the project, but we do have that currently from them. And as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Agenda 8B, which uh, Corey and uh, or with which Dean and then uh, Corey presented, I wanted to be able to remind you, I wanted to make sure you remembered, I, I had thanked them before, but keep in mind that their efforts in terms of serving on the selection committee and developing the budget and through this process were all philanthropic, philanthropic um, all of their, of their own time. And so just thank them again for that. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those or I can indicate what, um, motion we were looking for related to the design agreement. And, and, and I think what we are, uh, will be doing if, uh, we, if we your approval is, we'll be recommending authorizing the, uh, that we go with the architectural firm, but that is contingent upon approval of the agreement between Jado and Washburn University. Nothing will be, no action will be done until we have a signed agreement. That is that, correct. That's yes, the way that's we, uh, the legal aspect of it. Yes, uh, it would be a motion end. to approve the committee's recommendation and to authorize the JADO chair to execute the agreement contingent upon approval of the joint agreement with Washburn. And that could be within a month or period yes. of time when that uh, um, agreement is, is made or agreed upon by the parties that would then come to us for our approval. Correct. Okay, now does that, yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes. would we be holding a special meeting of JADO on that only, on that item or as to the actual agreement between JADO and Washburn University? There are a couple items that for which we may have a meeting, one of which is Project Morris if that goes through, we we'll have to we'll be fine. Yeah, yes, but there will be there could be several items that are that are really pending right now. I'm sure that Molly and uh, Matt would just hate having a lot of meetings I for know. approval of projects. Hopefully we can put them all together in uh, in a short time. They all fall in a week. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll do that. Yeah, Councilman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to kind of refresh for, for me, if you would, and, and maybe for the uh, those who want to follow up. The way this whole deal is falling together then in simple terms is that with, in terms of the financing of getting the building ready, between the money that Jada would be providing and the new market tax credits, that would cover 100% of getting the building ready, so no debt. It would fund the entire project. We've actually, Jado already voted and funded earlier this year the $4 million specifically for the project, for the demolition and for the construction. Correct. What Jado did not 
vote funding for was there was that gap funding for at least a million of the 1.5 million in partnership funds for operational expenses for Washburn Tech over the first three years of the of the of their tenancy in, in the facility. So the funding, that gap funding for new market tax credits is for those partnership funds. Okay. And then the operating expenses, the expectation in what you're negotiating is that Washburn would cover 100% of the operating of the expenses. Operating expenses. Mm -hmm. And then you are in this agreement that we will see in the future negotiating the specifics about what programming would be offered. They've talked about that, and that's that's based upon high wage, high demand data. We understand within the agreement that it may adjust, it may change, so that it is accurate and it ke it's kept timely with what the needs of the employers are in the community. And there's an expectation that Washburn would do the marketing and the the, the, the study for what the needs are in the community. There's an expectation that it's a community wide effort. Washburn is committed to doing that. The community is committed to doing that. Go Topeka is committed to to supporting all of that. So, okay. so I mean, it, it's a holistic effort there too. Uh -huh. That's that word keeps circling around, but it really is. It's community wide. It's collaborative. It's a partnership. Thank you. I just wanted to pull together. Mm -hmm. the simple yeah. package. Good. Thank you. Yeah. It's good to get around. Uh, and other questions or discussion? Just, just real yeah, quickly, sure. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Barbara, uh, uh, Monday before last, we did have a, a working group. And there were a number of issues that were discussed, a lot of questions that were unanswered, and there was supposed to be documentation provided. Are, is all of that just going to fall away? Uh, are we going to get answers to those questions? Are we going to have another meeting of the working group? What, where do we go from here? Well, I believe we've gotten one answer to one of those questions, and a couple of them that are in that, that pro forma that I mentioned. We received that pro forma yesterday. That's why it wasn't in your packet. I didn't want to stress out Brenda too much by trying to slide all of that in and start handing things out and not including the community. I want the community to be able to see that as well in advance of any meetings and in terms of consideration so they can have public comment. Um, we've, we've requested in terms of what the plan would look like and, and that data, I think a component of that is in the pro forma, a component of that is in the executive summary that's already on public record and in, in the previous JADO packets. Um, so there will, I think, be follow-up. I, I believe there was a communication to the group, work group yesterday sharing that pro forma and sharing that you know there would be further communication. We have um, requested that Glenda Du Bois and Lalo Munoz assist in chairing and co-chairing that work group to be able to make sure that the project is going to meet the needs of the community and moves forward and, and meets the requirements as set forth for, uh, for yourselves as elected officials as well. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah. So we'll be receiving those. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I got the performa and I, I looked it over and everything and I thought, this looks pretty good. What, what's the backup information? What's the source data? Mm -hmm. are, are these just plug numbers? Are they uh, swags? I mean, what are they? And, and what's the backup for those numbers? And that's all. Thank you, okay, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Okay. That, um, any other discussion on the item? So we've covered the three. We've covered um, the three. Three parts mm -hmm. of this. Um, now we can have a motion to approve, and then we'll have the public comment. Mm -hmm. If that, I'd like to make a motion. You, you, and that's, and we have this, uh, you're approving the selection committee's recommendation um, authorizing to execute an agreement contingent upon approval by the JADO of the joint education agreement with Washburn. That's correct. All right, that's what you said. Uh, Councilman DeLisa seconds. Any discussion? Okay, now we will have public comment for those who signed, and the first person, Joe Ledbetter. <laughs> All right, second is Wendy Wells. Third is Alonzo Harrison, just to make you aware. I don't uh, good evening, Hello. Wendy Wells. Uh, my day job is uh, U.S. Bank, and uh, my night job is hanging out around here. <laughs> um, I've been working closely with the uh, Holistic Economic Development uh, Committee as well as Go Topeka, and just wanted to remind the group that uh, this particular project fits very nicely into one of the major pillars of our Holistic Economic Development Plan, and. 
um, I had expressed some level of concern a meeting or two ago in regards to the new markets tax credits and I just wanted to kind of clear the record on that because I know you guys have good memories um, at the time I thought the project was at a lower threshold than seemed logical to pursue that um, I thought Jeff White did an exceptional job of doing the 101 explanation of uh, how new markets tax credits work. In my day job, I have an opportunity to work with those, and uh, I think this project fits very nicely into that um, uh, financing type structure. Uh, I just wanted to make myself available to you if you had any other questions about that. Um, my experience would be consistent with what Jeff expressed in that Kansas is ripe for a project. The dollars available are greater than they've ever been in, in the history of this particular type financing structure. And um, the city and the county have um, utilized Jeff White and his experience, uh, which is highly regarded in this space. And so I have a high comfort level for not only the project, but the tools that we're looking to implement. So any thank questions? You. Any questions for Barbara? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next is Alonzo Harrison to be followed by Glenda Du Bois. Good evening, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm again Alonzo Harrison. I am a uh, lifelong Topekian, a 501 uh, graduate, a Washburn graduate, and a business owner. Uh, I'm the president of HDB Construction. We are a 59-year-old company that's based here in Topeka. We work all across the country. Our uh, appreciation for what's being done in, uh, on this program is that it's something that I've been talking about and uh, trying to work with others for the last 20 or 30 years, having some of the educational opportunities extended to the eastern portion of the city. Uh, it is something that I think is absolutely essential. As a business person, we utilize uh, some of the uh, potential candidates, graduates of this program. We have a trucking division and uh, one of the classes that we hope that will uh, be generated be the CDL Class A, which is a uh, kind of a high high end trucking piece of the of the uh, the industry. We think that by doing this and doing it in the eastern portion of the city, you're going to be able to tap into an underutilized pool of talent that hasn't been getting the opportunity to really to uh, take advantage of the uh, Washburn Tech. I think with the great uh, combination of Washburn. Uh, with Go Topeka and the city of Topeka and this whole uh, pool of uh, untapped talent on the eastern side of the city, you're going to create and, and create some opportunities and enhance the quality of life for uh, the, another portion of the city. To me, I think it's a win-win. Uh, I certainly think and that it's going to be to the city's advantage if you all vote for it and support it, as I do and our company does, and I as a citizen. Okay? Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Clinton Du Bois. Good evening, good evening. I um, stand here representing, I serve on the Go Topeka board. I also uh, have been a, um, an executive director of the Antioch Family Life Center, which is across from the uh, East Topeka Learning Center to be. And uh, I have uh, just also a work uh, responsibility that really relates to engaging the community in that area in ways that can really uplift the life expectancy. So I'm really pleased to support that. Um, there is the number of people in that particular area who are either unemployed, underemployed, but yet employable. This is a great opportunity to provide a facility that will well, that will uh, bring into that community training and learning that's just very appropriate for that for that particular community. I know that it is one that uh, we're, we're not going in with the strategy that if we build it, they will come. It is one that will require community engagement, and we're committed to doing that, to speaking with the community and being sure that they are engaged and that we can bring to the community, to that center, those people who will benefit from it being there. So we certainly appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, well, we have a motion and second before us in approving this, um, the architecture, depending upon approval of the, uh, the agreement. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your right hand. 
We have seven yes. Seven having voted yes, the uh, motion is approved. Uh, we go to item nine, the clerk would read. Nine is an action item. Consider recommendation from the broadband task force to, to award RFP bid for the broadband consulting services and approve request to enter into negotiations for a contract. All right, I believe uh, Gina is there. Is, uh, <laughs> going to, to lead this off, and uh, I know there's some others that are in committee members that are part of this. Yes, I, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues on the Broadband Task Force. If you'd stand, please. Okay, yes. So we can see you. Thank you very much. Do you want to say, would you say their names? I think it's good. I'll let them say their names. All right, <laughs> and their, their association. I'm Pat Olander, I'm the IT Director with Shawnee County, Kansas. Patrick Clear, I'm the uh, coordinator of technology for Auburn Washington School District. I'm Mark Biswell, City of Topeka. Thank you. And I'm Mark Assessment Superintendent Shawnee Heights. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Gina Millsap, uh, Public Library CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so very pleased to be with you this evening. Thank you. Um, as you'll recall, um, I had the opportunity to speak with you about this topic on February at the JDO board meeting of February 8th. Um, the, this task force was appointed by Mayor Wolgask and Commissioner Bueller. Um, and at that time, we presented information on the importance of access to broadband services uh, or high-speed internet, as it's also known, for the future prosperity of this community of Topeka and Shawnee County. Uh, Shawnee Heights School Superintendent uh, Martin Stessman and I both spoke that evening in support of a request to JADO to issue an RFP to, and I will quote, assist JADO in discovering and implementing a plan and public-private partnership necessary to provide sufficient, reliable, and affordable high-speed broadband service delivery to the residents, residents of Topeka and Shawnee County. Um, and that was approved. Um, in your packet is a document that outlines Again, the genesis of this project uh, with the Intergovernmental Cooperation Council in 2013. Um, the work that that committee did with the Kansas Department of Commerce uh, as one of four statewide broadband planning initiative communities, and then the resulting development of the task force to really continue that work. Um, it's also making the case for a commitment to what should be considered community infrastructure and an essential service for all Topekans and Shawnee Countyans. I believe that's the correct <laughs> term we should use. Um, it's also designed to create a perception that we are a progressive community. Um, when the pilot project ended, Mayor Wolgast and Commissioner Bueller formed a task force to move forward with a community-based plan that would result in Topeka and Shawnee County becoming a connected community, focused on three big goals, and they were identified in the pilot project. They are encouraging and supporting entrepreneurship and economic development, eliminating the digital divide, and ensuring all residents are digitally literate and will have 21st century work skills. Um, the members of the task force are listed in your uh, document. There are 17 of us. Um, they are from the city and the county, schools, the library, and Go Topeka, representing a diverse group of interests and expertise. Um, so the task force was charged with developing uh, a request for proposal with the intent of hiring a consultant with expertise in telecommunications and technology services, specifically in internet services and broadband. So we developed that RFP in late 2016, brought that to you uh, for 17 for approval, and then issued it immediately following that. We received seven proposals from consulting firms. We formed a subcommittee uh, of the task force that included Mark Biswell, Pat Oblander, uh, Patrick Clear, and myself. Uh, to develop an evaluation process, uh, which included a rating system and conference calls with client references. Uh, there was consensus by the committee that a company called Tilson Technology Management was the best choice for the project. And that was because uh, Tilson demonstrated an excellent understanding of the scope of and ability to perform all five phases of the project. It is an extensive and rather complex project. Uh, a realistic assessment of cost, an expert team with significant experience in a wide range of similar projects all over the United States, 
a high rate of success in assisting communities with these types of projects. Uh, and a high level of accountability to the funding agency. And um, as, you, as we were reviewing that, we felt that was very important. So there is there are multiple points of contact with the JADO board and with the community as well. Uh, what also distinguishes Tilson's proposal from the others is that is, it is the only vendor that has the highest level of access to data from a company called CostQuest. Um, validating that data, which includes the previously mentioned feasibility and economic impact studies that were done as part of the pilot project with the Kansas Department of Commerce, is one of the requirements of the RFP and essential to the to the success of the future project. Uh, and it was clear that Tilson was best positioned to not only analyze that data, but to actually add to it. So why does this matter? Outcomes. Ultimately, the intent of the project is to develop an RFI, RFP, for the development of a public-private partnership that will collaborate on the development of an advanced broadband fiber and wireless network that will provide the entire community, including its most rural areas, with high-speed internet access. And we know and shared previously that communities with this technology infrastructure have an advantage in attracting everything from advanced manufacturing to contact and data centers. They can nurture tech startups and home-based businesses, provide better education and health care for residents, and deliver government services more efficiently and engage citizens in government. The timeline for this, pending your approval, uh, is to negotiate a contract with Tilson Technology Management um, um, and, of course, your approval of the resulting contract. Tilson estimates the process will take, inclusive of all five phases, will take approximately 17 months. How many did you say? 17. 17. 17. Mm -hmm. Uh, the estimated cost, that's always an important question to answer, uh, they have proposed a milestone-based fixed fee of $205,215. And I believe the budget allocation for this request is $250,000. Uh, we were well aware of that and uh, we're certainly committed to staying within that budget. Um, with that, I will certainly stand for questions or um, allow my colleagues to stand for questions if they if they wish all right uh, mr mayor questions yeah councilman commissioner cook miss Millsap, mm -hmm. if you if i was a commissioner um, approaching a person on the street to explain to them what um, tilson technology management is going to do in our community in plain english what is it they're really doing what are we hiring them to do they are coming in actually with quite a bit of expertise. One of the things they will do is we already have a feasibility study that looks at cost for a build, an advanced broadband network, network build, and economic impact study. Those figures, that data though is a few years old now. The first, one of the first things they will do is they have the expertise to actually analyze that data, determine its accuracy, and then expand on that. Um, they will also be developing actually um, a, a much broader cost analysis of what it would take. They will be working on um, modeling for what a public, a potential public-private partnership would be and the cost associated with that. They will work with us on community engagement because a large part of this is engaging the community and educating the community about the importance of broadband because once the network is built, what's called the take rate or the participation, who becomes customers of that is very important to its future success. Um, Mark, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, that's a really good start, yes. Well, I would encourage you to Finish her off. <laughs> so it actually, or the, the, the end goal is to provide broad base for the entire county and all and the, the areas. The deliverable from the consultant, you know, what do you get for your money? The deliverable will, in addition to all these other services, they will be helping us develop an RFI or request for information for the, an actual build. They will help us review those vendor responses and they will help us then uh, develop um, uh, a funding strategy moving forward if that is our desire to move forward at that point. Go ahead. But I, I think that I recall from our prior presentations on the Broadband Initiative mm -hmm. is that it is not feasible, at this point at least, 
for JADO to provide broadband service throughout the entire county. It's not economic in infrastructure. It's not economic in just the practicalities. It's beyond what we could accomplish as JADO and that we would need vast private-public partnerships to even make a dent and an impact in our rural community. That's correct, and that's actually part of the work that would be done to identify that and develop that model. Okay, and, and so Tillers, or Tilson Technology Management is going to be assisting us in that endeavor? Yes, in actually designing that, in effect. They can actually also do a design of a network itself, but that would be something that we would look at as an alternative. Um, but basically, they can do an end-to-end -end service on this, but what we need from them is a plan that identifies public-private partners, costs, and then how a network like this would actually be deployed, because it would include both fiber and wireless. And has Tilson Technology Management done this in other communities? Yes, numerous times. And they've done it in a wide variety of sizes and areas. So they've worked in very rural areas. Um, one of the client references we spoke with was in New York State. But the project and the project they're working on there is about a half a billion dollar project, but it's for deployment of broadband to very rural areas of New York. Um, there, um, the phrase we heard mentioned was fiber to the farm. Um, and so there, they, when we spoke with them, they said, well, you're in pretty good shape because you actually have providers. Uh, in some instances where we're working on deployment, there are no telecommunication providers. So Tilson has um, extensive experience in working with local government, with private sector companies as well, uh, and they've managed both small and large projects. Okay, Mark, you want to add first? She answered all my all all my answers. So. Okay, all right, well, I learned okay. everything from him. So. Uh, other, other questions, discussion. Councilwoman Hiller. Just to follow up on that, since he was asking for the one-minute elevator speech on the on the on the street, so it would be accurate. Just tell me if I'm right to say that we're hiring these people to figure out how we can possibly serve everyone in the whole county, either with fiber or wireless, and what it would cost to do it, with, of course, a goal to do it as inexpensively as possible, but we're not expecting it to be free. Well said. Is that right. fair? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And so it's the plan. Yeah. They'll develop the plan. Right. And the process, and how can it, how it can be implemented, and how it can be funded, how it can be funded, mm -hmm. and to, and to help form the partnerships. Mm -hmm. All right, I, Mr. Mayor, yeah, I would say Bueller. stressing the public-private partnership. Correct. I mean, um, I I know that that's been an emphasis for our our task force mm -hmm. all along. We're, we're not, we, we have not yeah. said free internet. We're we're no. not saying that. We're well, we're saying we're looking at. How we can how we can plan into the future. We're looking for affordable. What we're looking for is so that we're because one of the things we're looking at that digital divide is geographic and it's also economic. Exactly. And exactly. so and 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 just providing these opportunities so that it should not matter where you live in our community. You can run your home business. Your children can participate in educational activities and all the other things that we rely on broadband now for. And, and I know, Marty, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah. it might be a good time to talk a little bit about education and how this may impact education. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I would reference back to about uh, 10, 12 years ago when I came here. Uh, we increased our internet uh, uh, bandwidth to uh, four megabytes, and we we're pretty tall cotton. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Right now, I think you're running right now here at, uh, at, at about 70 down and 80 up. Uh, so uh, the need for high-speed uh, broadband internet isn't going to go away and, and it will never ever decrease. That's what we know. Access to education is critical. Our partnerships with the library are critical, allowing our kids to access their resources from their living room but only if they have uh, high-speed broadband internet access. So uh, all I know is technology and bandwidth uh, and the demand for that will continue to increase. The usage for that will continue to increase, and this uh, will help set us up for the future. 
Do you have just some figures about what percentage of your students live where they would not have? About a quarter of our kids do too, and I know that other Washburn and Seaman would have similar numbers in that. So about a quarter of the kids in the rural areas of the, of the county would not have access right now. Okay. Uh, and they're reduced to going to literally the closest McDonald's uh, or another location that provides free access. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, more of a question, I guess a procedural question. Tonight, this is just to allow negotiations to begin, correct, with, with the Tilson Technologies, at which point, um, would that come back to us for approval of a final contract? Yes. Or? Is that legal? Mm -hmm. Is that yes, the way that's correct. it would be? Because I believe the city handled the RFP process, correct? Through the that's purchase? That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Okay. Let's come so back to this. I've Thank been you. Um, asked to um, respectfully request a motion to approve the broadband task force's recommendation and to authorize contract negotiations uh, with uh, Tilson Technology. Why am I mad? Where's my name here? Tilson uh, Technology Management. Thank you, Tilson Technology Management. So this will be the third reason for that meeting we're going to have. <laughs> <laughs> the, Mor the Morris contract, the Washburn so agreement. So there would be a meeting before your next regular meeting? Yeah, right. Which would certainly help us expedite yeah. the process. Okay, it's making more worthwhile. Right. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. I, I did want to say that, that I was uh, skeptical and uninformed, and, and I spent about half an hour with Pat Oblander this morning uh, discussing the project, and I probably know less now <laughs> than before I started talking to Pat. But one thing I did, uh, who was driven home to me, is we need to consider this if we're gonna grow and thrive as a community, and that's what's important. So I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Dilla Isla seconds. Um, there is no public comment. Is there any other discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your right hand. We have seven yes. Seven having voted yes. No, um, we have, it, it is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for the committee. Again, all yes. the good volunteer hours yeah. that went into this. I know there was a great deal of time and effort in it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Go to um, uh, item 10. 10 is discussion and possible action of selection of an independent contractor. <laughs> yes, um, <clears throat> this was on the agenda in, uh, in our February meeting, and at that time, um, <clears throat> it was agreed that we would, <clears throat> before this meeting, or by the time of the May meeting, we would have a draft uh, contract uh, put together, and I believe today that you received a copy of a uh, comparison with the changes in this contract uh, with the current one that, that we are looking at. And um, maybe I should preface to say that the uh, county, uh, county council, the city attorney, and the, um, and Go Topeka have met a number of times if you want to say in negotiations or in discussion, and the those entities have agreed with this contract as it is proposed to us. You can see the uh, the changes there on your, the document, <clears throat> and the the um, the second there on the economic development. Uh, and as, as you recall, in our in our local agreement, uh, the the description of what our economic development mission is was expanded and that is referenced in this contract uh, in the past the contract has just referenced the, the the interlocal agreement as what is our description or what is the purpose that we work on um, and then the other change was in the um, inquiries from jado members uh, we met uh, made it very specific that it in that um, we uh, Inquiries from all board members are responded to, uh, make it very clear that um, all are treated similarly, whether they're voting or non-voting members. And other than that, um, there are no other changes. Is, uh, discussion? I know there's been, uh, in the interest of period of time, <coughs> there's been a feeling that it's important that 
we make a decision before too long and just for the sake of our go to Pika, as we heard earlier, we're finalists on some major projects. Um, so we want to certainly have that format of moving ahead and working together as a unit. Um, I'll move to approve. Second. Okay, we have Mr. Archer's move to approve the contract. We'll go with Commissioner Cook seconds. Uh, we have people to speak on this. Um, and so we'll first is Joe Ledbetter. Thank you, uh, Jada members. Uh, back in February, I talked to uh, Matt and, and Wendy. I actually met with them and uh, thought that this was premature to bring up that time since uh, there'd been no real public notice. And uh, so in the intervening three months, there's been time for people to talk, time for people to come down, public comments, uh, make, make their concerns known. <coughs> And I guarantee you three years ago, I wanted an RFP because I was very unsatisfied with what was going on with uh, this contract for a huge number of reasons, too many to list tonight. Uh, most of that's changed. Uh, I've had a, I've been impressed by Matt, mostly because of his integrity and his accessibility, but uh, probably the the best thing I've seen out of him is a willingness to listen to other people in the room. Not always try to pretend or act that he's the smartest guy in the room. He may or he may not be. Uh, you don't have to have an attitude just because you've got a contract uh, with the public. And we had huge attitude uh, three years ago. And it was very obvious to the public, it may not have been obvious to the politicians, but it was very obvious to the public. And they were getting very fed up with it. Um, I've talked to a number of the political people. I've talked to uh, a number of the people on the boards in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I believe they are very committed to changing the way they've operated. And it's not good enough to talk about it with me. I think you know me that well. I've got to see the actions. I've got to see actual proof that things are different. And so I have seen that. And uh, uh, so I personally, and this is just my personal position, it's not the position of any group or organization, because I have represented an organization, and they've been very adamant about they want transparency and accountability with these monies, and they want benchmarks. Uh, but I told them, I said, you're gonna have to make your own mind up. I think I've already made mine up. Uh, and I, I do support what Matt's doing. Uh, now, such time as he can't do this job or he changes, and I think this wording in this contract is good. I, I'd like to see a little firmer wording, but if you're going to vote on this tonight, I, I, I don't know that I'm opposed to it. I'm not. I'm, but I, I think you can always tighten these contracts up a little more. Uh, I don't know that we had a real good public vetting of the contract, but nonetheless, in the spirit of what's offered, uh, I believe that if uh, things stay the same, the way they're being operated, uh, we're going to have public input, and we're going to have people that are going to be brought in that will be able to bring in more success because we're not shutting people out, simply because they're not in this group or that group, but they actually, you know, I, I will tell you this. <clears throat> It's been my experience working as a lawyer, okay? I don't have to like every lawyer I deal with, but I do have to work with them. Mm -hmm. Whether we're in agreement to go to court or going to court, we have to sign pretrial orders, we have to, or we're in negotiations. Uh, I don't have to like everybody I meet, but I do have to work with them. And I, I wish more people would learn that lesson because it's, it's been a very good lesson to learn in life. There, you don't have to agree with everything somebody says or even how they say it, uh, but you can, you can get agreement. I'm gonna ask for another two minutes because I have a couple things I wanna 
to say about this, if you'd allow me. Okay. Yeah, extend for two minutes. Second. Okay. Commissioner Bueller seconds. Um, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, seven yes. Curious. To tell the truth and the okay. whole Okay. You may continue for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> When Matt got here, I was told by uh, the previous city manager, you're really gonna like Matt. You're really gonna like Matt, Joe. You just, you just gotta meet him. I said, I'll make my own mind up. I mean, that's how I am. Uh, as I said, he's got integrity, but what it was better than that because I started meeting the board members and I started talking to them. And I saw a willingness to change direction, not incrementally, but rapidly. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, if we had had the potential fiasco a month ago of this hospital closing, and I, I talked to a lot of people immediately, I said, you cannot let that hospital go dark. That's too big a hit on this community. I actually think with previous management, it would have failed. I really believe that. And I appreciate the politicians getting involved, the commissioner and the the mayor, but you had to have somebody in this position that actually knew how to talk to people and negotiate and keep the ball going. And I, I'm not minimizing whatever the governor did or the AG did. I know a lot of people participate in that. And I really think KU is the best choice. And it's not just because I've got one of my degrees from there, but I really believe that if somebody of Matt's caliber who would have actually listened to the public in 2012, I don't think we would have lost Hallmarks. I don't think we would have lost Jostens. And I guarantee you someday I'll probably be proven right. Because <laughs> I don't think they can prove to me with any evidence that they did anything to save those two plants. And uh, I've talked to a lot of people, more than you know. But what I'm gonna say is, uh, I'm comfortable with this contract at this time and with these changes. Uh, and that's just me, one person's opinion. Okay. okay? Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Carol Marple, to be followed by Scott Griffith. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, you all know that I've been to a lot of these meetings for a lot of years. And I would be the first to say, I now enjoy coming to them. And that is due to Matt and the way his staff presents them. And they're just much more interesting and understandable. But when I saw that we were gonna do a discussion on possibly offering another three-year contract to go to PICA, I really thought long and hard about this. And as I said, I would be the very first to say that we have seen a vast improvement since Matt has become the CEO of Go Topeka in January of 2016. But I also think we have to remember that we are discussing $5 million a year of taxpayer money. And as one of those taxpayers, what I would like to see done is an offer of a one-year contract, and I have no problem with the way it is written, what was presented in the packet, and I think this could be done from January 1, 2018 to January 1, 2019. We can't live in the past, but we have to remember it. A lot of people would agree, I'm sure, that there was a great deal of taxpayer money squandered in the past. When an RFP was put out three years ago, it was a dismal failure. I will say no more about that, but we do all have memories. I think that we all agree changes have been made and excellent changes. We still need to have more though. That is why I'd like to see this contract extended for only one year, which would give Matt and his current staff more time to establish history. And at the end of 2019, or the end of 2018, the JADO board could look over the year, reflect more, Matt would have been here more times, 
and with more information than offer, if that's what they so decide, a three-year contract to go to Pekin. Um, I think we just have to proceed with caution. You know, it's wonderful the turnaround that we have, but we can't be hasty, and that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Scott Griffith to be followed by Wendy Wells. Uh, good evening. Um, you probably won't see my smiling face as often uh, here in the next uh, year or so. So I wanted to take uh, advantage of this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank Matt and his team. Um, it's not a one-man show or a one-person show. Matt's got an incredible team, and I thought they did a fantastic job tonight in presenting their quarterly report, um, our audit. Uh, we have some great auditors. And I think that demonstrates the, the financial and fiscal responsibility that this organization has uh, um, uh, performed on behalf of JADO and this community uh, for the last several years. Uh, the audit uh, was a was glowing report. And I think we've managed the funds that uh, uh, we've been entrusted with uh, very well. Uh, I, I have to also compliment many of you, I think, attended the annual meeting that we had preceding to the, tonight's meeting. Uh, that video, that uh, Vito Mike, uh, um, uh, or Motovike, I'm sorry, I mispronounced their name, I apologize. Unbelievable, I mean, how energizing is that? And here we are on the cusp of, uh, of a five-year strategic plan that's getting ready to be implemented in January. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd go for a five-year contract to match up with their five-year economic development plan. Uh, but I think a three-year plan makes sense. It gives Matt and his team the, the, the freedom and the running room to start planning accordingly and really focus on their work and not to be worrying about, you know, a, a contract that's going to come due, you know, 12 months from now. Um, <clears throat> I want you to know, and I think many of you already do know, over the last two years since um, uh, we went through the process to to evaluate uh, candidates for, for the role that uh, Matt is uh, now serving um, and then bringing him on board. We have done a lot uh, on the Go Topeka board. Uh, I served as board chair for two years and uh, currently still serve on the, uh, on the executive committee. Uh, we've done a lot in terms of governance. We've, we've strengthened our board. We've expanded it. We're more diversified. We've got non-investors that are board members. Uh, we've got processes in place that are working well ahead of time. Uh, we've got a committee structure now where we've got board members and non-board members active and, and involved in, in assisting Matt and, and our very capable team. So I think we've done a lot of things from a governance perspective that has strengthened our board. And so um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of our community and, and on behalf of the board for what you do. Um, uh, I encourage and, and recommend and support the, the approval of the uh, contract as recommended and uh, just uh, appreciate your consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments. Wendy Wells to be followed by Keith Warta. Okay. Keith Warta to be followed by Angel Zimmerman. Good evening, I'll try and be brief. Um, I, I wrote down five points that I just wanna make relative to this agreement. And the first one I would say is we deal, our, our company deals with solicitation processes all the time and the first thing that we recommend to clients is if you've got somebody that, that is doing their job well, stick with them. There's no need to go through a solicitation process and waste everybody's time. Um, so that's where I would start. I mean, go to Pika. <clears throat> Uh, I, I support this agreement because Go Topeka is first and foremost producing results. Uh, Go Topeka has proven to be a top-notch economic development organization attracting national industry and retaining and expanding existing businesses. Go staff is well respected within the industry and Go has provided holistic economic development within our community. Secondly. I support extending this agreement because the organization has been able to leverage the community supported sales tax funding with private support. Thirdly, I support this uh, agreement because Go Topeka brand is affiliated with Topeka and, it, and should we, God forbid, go with somebody else, uh, I think it would be damaging to our community. Fourthly, I support this agreement because spending funds in preparation of proposals directs time and money away from economic development activities. 
And fifthly, I support extending this agreement because the organization has been a key leader in developing holistic economic development strategy for our community and they are in the best position to implement it. The other thing I might just add is that I think a three-year term is fair and written within the agreement are termination clauses that if, if you should desire to, to go a shorter term, you have that obligation or that opportunity. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Angel Zimmerman. I pass. Uh, to be followed by Eugene Williams. A pass. All right. Thank you. That completes the public comment. Um, and board, we have a motion and second for us to approve the uh, Go Topeka uh, contract and authorize its execution. Any other discussion? Councilman Thank Hiller. you, Mayor. Uh, I want to make two comments. One, as Karen Hiller, the councilwoman who's a member of the JADO board, I just wanted to recognize um, Scott and Keith and the others who are here. I mean, I've served on this through the transition where people kind of beat on go Topeka and said, come on, let's let's freshen it up, let's go. And with both the plan and the way the partnerships were developed and and put together and, and the, the committees that you, you made reference to and that we've all seen, task work groups and so on, that really has happened. And uh, kudos and hats off to all of you. Uh, Karen Hiller also supported a three-year contract before, and I do think that that works, and I think this one is well constructed. Um, I am voting tonight, however, as a proxy for, for Deputy Mayor Cohen, who has asked me to vote no, because he felt it should have been bid out, and so my no vote hmm. will reflect that proxy role. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, C Commissioner Cook. Thank you. Uh, I will be voting yes, but I want to put forth, I can see a time when there may need to be a prudent um, RFP process to rebid. I don't know that we would continue to renew three years after three years. At the county level, there has been a great benefit in having an RFP, a review of our services with our contractors, whether it's to address issues that we have with our contractors, uh, maybe there's terms that are outdated or there's new needs that we didn't contemplate when we originally started to, to work with each other. Or maybe there's a better contractor in the community or outside of our community that can provide services. So I think that it is prudent for us to approve this three-year agreement with Go Topeka today. But that's not to say that in three years we would not be engaging in an RFP process to see where we're at. Okay. And so just to lay that forth. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second before us to uh, approve the uh, contract. All those in favor, raise your right hand. We have six yes. Ms. Hiller ready now. With six having voted yes, the contract is approved. And I think speaking for the board as comments, uh, we think very highly of uh, Matt, your work and that of the, the staff. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing, and we look forward to continuing uh, for three more years. Uh, that completes item N. Uh, next is item 11. It's discussion on the 49th Street Improvement Project. All right, an update on 49th Street. And you have less than four to nine minutes. Mm. Yes, I will be extremely brief, so. <laughs> This isn't an action item, but I just wanted to give you guys a brief update to let you know where we are um, with improving 49th Street. Uh, Bartlett and West is working diligently to, to uh, tick past those, those, um, those tasks that need to be completed to get this project to uh, bid from the city um, at the end of June. So just to remind you, we're in a Central Crossing Commerce Park, north of Home Depot, between Winger and um, the newly constructed bridge just west of the rail. So um, just some of the things that have been completed, the survey has been done, field checks complete. The plan is to have the final review to the city by the end of this week, and then we're still on track for that bidding process to be let in the end of June. And so um, that would allow for construction to take place and be completed by the end of December. Okay. And I really, I'll just stand for any questions. I just thought since we were here, I'd give an update yeah. and let you know that everything's on track. Very tight time frame, but yes. we're, we're meeting it. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that. Thank you. 
That completes the agenda items. We will go to public comment. First to speak is Joe Ledbetter. Governing body, Jada, thank you. Um, <clears throat> real quick, I wanna reiterate uh, on an earlier item, uh, the East Topeka Learning Center. The reason I didn't comment tonight, because I have been on record supporting that all along, and I continue to, is I was just looking for a little more information about the contract, which I said last time we need to have one, and they're doing it. So uh, thankfully, uh, people are moving forward on that. Uh, <clears throat> One of the big concerns that I hear about in this community, and it's not just because I help High Crest and I've now four, oh, four and a half years helping them this time around, uh, but I hear this all across the community. I hear it on the west side, I hear it on the east side, I hear it on the north side, I hear it in central Topeka. This city has not done a good job and continues to not do a good job of code enforcement. Now why am I bringing that up at this meeting? Because in your interlocal agreement, and this contract is uh, reflecting the new, new uh, interlocal agreement uh, strengths and uh, things that they want you to do under economic development, they talk about neighborhoods. They talk about strengthening neighborhoods and housing. And I had a person comment uh, at an earlier meeting today, said, well, you know, how do we get there? I said, you just do it. You just enforce it. And it doesn't necessarily take more money, it takes resolve. And when I see uh, people being written up in a retaliatory fashion in this community uh, with nice houses in Knollwood, simply because they complained at the city council or somewhere else, and then they send those inspectors out and they say there's nothing wrong, uh, and then they send them down to uh, the 2000 block or the 1900 block of Kansas Avenue and write somebody up over a one foot dandelion just because it popped up the night before from heavy rains while the rest of the block looks like a pigsty hmm. and they look right past it. We have unequal enforcement. We have retaliation going on. We have people that are left untouched that are slumlords and that's provable uh, in Highcrest and other parts of this community. Uh, they're never written up. They're never written up uh, for the multiple of offenses. And we were told at uh, the High Crest meeting last time by somebody that oversees code enforcement that their enforcement officers do not drive right by other properties that are problems, that they write everything up that they see. Uh, that is not true. And the reason I'm bringing this up is this is economic development and it affects the image of this city and quite frankly, it affects people wanting to stay in Topeka. There are people that will move out because they have had it with slumlords on their blocks or that atypical homeowner that just doesn't care that maybe they inherited the house from grandma and they moved in here from Osage county and they don't, and I'm not knocking them, but you know, they, sometimes that's where they came from. And they, they park their cars in the yard and they got the dog on a chain and uh, there's trash all over. And, and I have been to this code court numerous times. I've watched it. I've represented people here. My, my clients clean their properties up. They don't want to be in court and they don't want to pay legal fees in addition to fines. But uh, Anybody can pick their trash up. And to see people getting continuances when they've got just a trash problem, that's ridiculous. Everybody can clean up after themselves. So uh, I'm bringing this up on record, on JADO, because this is a community-wide concern in the city of Topeka that codes are not being enforced properly. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, Carol Marple. I'm gonna pass, but I do okay. want to say congratulations. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. That completes the public comment. I was, it was noted to me that this is Economic Development Week, National Economic Development Week, and so we are celebrating that. Uh, but I think the most significant thing is what we did at this meeting tonight. We heard the quarterly report, 
We took action on a contract with Mars. We approved a funding for a Morris project. We learned, took steps with the East Topeka Learning Center. Uh, we did the, uh, the next steps on uh, with broadband and now taking action on approving a contract for next year. So I think economic development is pretty good in Topeka and Shawnee County, mm -hmm. taking some good steps. Thank you, board members. Being no other business before us, we are adjourned.